most dangerous women in Maryland. They are murderers, dealers, and thieves. I've been shot, shot at. You, got, you go through that, through the game. That's called a game. From career criminals to first timers, all housed in one prison. I just didn't know what I was coming into. You're mixed in with all different people. For many, rage and violence are a way of life. You're going to look out for yourself because nobody else is going to. But it's a prisoner. It's not that hard. We got into a heated argument and she choked me. Welcome to the world of Maryland's female convicts. Get out of my face. Jessup, Maryland, outside of Baltimore. Home to the only prison for the state's female felons. Killers, kidnappers, addicts. They all land here at Maryland Correctional Institution for Women, or MCIW. They never stop coming. Each year, about 1,300 inmates pass through the prison's intake center, where they are strip searched, interviewed, and assigned a place in the system. Many come fresh off the brutal streets of Baltimore, a city just 15 miles north of the prison and one of the most violent in the nation. I've been shot, shot at, you know. It's just crazy. You, got, you go through that, through the game. That's called a game. I put a gun into my face. I never liked that. Thank you, Jesus, that the gun ain't go off. Or I would have been over here for life. At MCIW, these new arrivals will live alongside every type of felon. 900 offenders are housed here. Minimum to maximum security. The highly aggressive with the low risk. All mixed together. Put the right. Else, cut. Some inmates have more trouble than others adjusting, like Paris Pratt. It's tight. I have had roommates where I had to get them out because I can't. I don't have a lot of patience these days with the foolishness and all of the craziness that people bring to your room. I don't decorate. I haven't decorated this cell because I don't want to feel like this is my home. Paris arrived a year ago and is still struggling to settle in. Some days I wake up good, other days I wake up bad, other days I wake up feeling very homicidal. Though only 25 years old, she will be here for the rest of her life. Abandoned as a teenager, Paris started dealing crack to support herself on the streets. Now, she's been convicted of killing a 16-year-old boy in cold blood. I was convicted of first-degree murder, and I was sentenced to a life sentence plus 25 years with no parole. I've been painted this picture as a monster. Paris was the first woman sentenced to life without parole in Montgomery County, a middle-class suburban area outside of Washington, D.C. I shot, fired two shots. He fell backwards, fell on his back, was laying on the ground, trying to get up, but it's like he couldn't. Police say she thought the boy was a snitch. She claims that it was self-defense. Things got ugly. And when his hand came out of his pocket a little bit, I saw the knife in his hand. So my first instincts, just like anybody else, was to defend myself. Paris is trying hard to keep herself in check behind bars. If she breaks the rules, she'll wind up in segregation or lock. If somebody touches me, I'm definitely going on lock because I'm definitely going to defend myself. Lock is the unit reserved for the highly violent and explosive. Offenders are confined to their cells 23 hours a day. It's the last place inmates want to be. I haven't been on lock, thank God. But, because I have an attitude. I do have an attitude. 
You're going to look out for yourself because you have to, because nobody else is going to. If I stay here and I let somebody stab me in here, I'm stabbed. They're not going to give a damn about what caused it, who did what or whatever. The first thing I'm going to do is say, oh, okay, you did it. Lock her up. It's up to officers like Captain Hannah to keep Paris and other inmates under control. In her 20-year career, this wife and mother of three has come across every type of criminal, male and female. She knows that these women are dangerously on the edge. You're working with people who have committed crimes, have the potential to commit more crimes, so that's the danger element. You're working with people who are unstable, um, have a lot of mental health issues, emotional issues, and some people are just not going to like you just because. This afternoon, Captain Hannah is making rounds on the prison campus, making sure inmates are inside, getting ready for daily count. She's aware of how unpredictable and unstable these women can be and is careful as she approaches an agitated offender in a nearby building. Somebody wants to help me. I want help. I want somebody to help me. That's what I want. I want to stop banging on the doors and the windows, begging for help, and nobody is helping me. I need help. What's the problem? I don't understand. The inmate might try to reach through the bars in the window and hurt someone. So Captain Hannah must calm her down. Quiet and try to appease me. It's easier to talk them down as long as you keep calm. Eventually they'll come down. But if you start screaming, hollering, getting excited with them, it's going to blow up proportion, and you won't be able to get control of the situation. There's always a possibility that I could be attacked. Some have tried uh, in the past, so the threat is always there. I don't forget where I am. I remember where I am. I am in prison. <laughs> Inside, inmates are locking down. They're free to be out of their cells for most of the day, but must be back for 2.30 afternoon count. Don't be disrespectful. Like I'm not being disrespectful. Like Actually, I'm you didn't have to say get out of the You didn't have to say that. I don't want to be on You didn't have to say that, though. All right. I'm <laughs> on a housing unit floor, one officer watches up to 112 inmates with only a radio for backup. They are unarmed so that weapons do not fall into the wrong hands. But that means control is crucial here. <laughs> Building 192 is one of the prison's four main housing units. It's broken into four wings. One of them, D-Wing, houses inmates who have serious anger and behavioral issues. Yeah. I mean, it's just a bunch of chaos. People banging on the door. She wants to kick and bang, scream, cuss out the police, or cuss out the inmates walking past her door. Whatever, just stuff like that. Inmate Christy Seal has trouble getting along with others. So she lives alone in her 8 by 5 cell. I got an anger issues real bad. And me dealing with my anger issues, I couldn't be somebody's roommate. Christy is serving a five-year sentence for attempting to sell crack. This marks Christy's third trip to the prison. An addiction to crack cocaine keeps bringing her back. I can't stop getting high. It's just, I guess it's a mind over matter thing. But Christy is determined to make this her last trip to MCIW. She hopes to earn her high school diploma while behind bars. She's also working hard to get out early. For the first time, a family is waiting for her on the outside. All my life, I've never had my mother. Now I'm 33 years old, and now my mother's decided at 51 years old, she wants to decide to be a mother to me. She's decided she don't want the drugs. She wants a life with being around me and my sister. Christy hopes if she behaves herself, she can make parole and leave prison in two years instead of five. To do that, she can't go off on inmates in the prison's general population. If I can't deal with people in population, how am I going to deal with people in society? To help keep calm, she turns to her inmate girlfriend. But that means breaking the rules. She's like my soulmate. I mean, we're so much alike, but we're so different, too. And it's like, we just belong together. 
The prison doesn't allow for relationships since they often lead to conflict. And the last thing Christy needs is any more trouble. Across the prison campus, inmate Jill Newland is a first timer to the prison. Hers is not a typical criminal background and this place makes her anxious. I just didn't know what I was coming into. It was the unknown, it was really scary. You are mixed in with lifers, you're mixed in with all different people. The 34-year-old grew up in a middle-class suburb of Baltimore, attended college, and led a comfortable life until she got hooked on painkillers. It just escalated. I ran out of prescription medication, so I went to other things. I started experimenting with heroin, uh, cocaine, things like that. Jill soon found herself disappearing for days into Baltimore drug houses. People were dealing drugs out of the house, constantly people in and out, in and out, probably up to 60 to 70 people in the house at a time. It's just crazy where drugs lead you. She eventually turned to crime to support her habit. Convicted of first degree burglary, Jill got an eight year sentence, but was put on probation. She violated her probation and is now doing hard time. Prison is tough enough for first timers, but for Jill, it's proving even harder. She was three months pregnant when coming to prison, but then found out she is having twins when she arrived. I didn't know I was having twins, so I got down here. So it was a joyful occasion, then it was sad. Um, the girl we're gonna name Savannah Hope, and um, the boy's gonna be Jacob. Jill already has a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son, both of whom live with her husband. My two at home, I don't really talk about that much. It's like a sore subject because it's I sit there and it's it's hard to deal with. You know, one day I was there, the next day I'm gone. Um, I really wasn't being a good mom because a good mom doesn't get high. In this prison, pregnant inmates are treated like everyone else. I thought like they'd have a whole little pregnancy area and like, you know, just I thought it would be different. Not where you be mixed in with general population. I was nervous about that at first because I was thinking if there was a fight, you know, it's very easy for me to, you know, get bumped into. Anything could happen and, yeah, that scared me. I mean, you have to watch yourself. Because she is carrying twins, Jill's pregnancy is considered high risk. Twins are often premature, and her past drug use could compromise the baby's health. As her due date nears, the prison has confined Jill to the infirmary, a small wing separate from the main housing units. Security cameras monitor these women 24-7 in case something goes wrong. I'm really concerned about their health. I mean, I think their health is good, but it's still scary because you don't know. I mean, I won't know until the babies are born. As it's getting closer, it's getting worse. But I can't do anything about it, so I've just tried to deal with it. I have to take it one day at a time and just hope for the best. But Jill will have to deal with far more than she expects in the days to come. MCIW, the only women's state prison in Maryland. Some inmates stay only a few months, others remain for life. The number of women behind bars is climbing at a rate nearly twice as fast as that for men. There are more women now that are committing crimes that, um, which leads to incarceration. Anywhere from prostitution to drug charges, murder charges, theft, just as volatile as male crimes. It is 10 a.m. Friday morning. Captain Hannah meets with a group of inmates. She knows that some of these women may be headed for trouble if they make the wrong friends. Women come in here, you're emotionally unstable. You develop these relationships with other women who are emotionally unstable, and it doesn't work out. Please try not to get caught up into any of the foolishness here. You give you Captain Hannah even tries to drive home the message by sharing her own past. 
sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. I've been through it all myself, but you can change. It could have been me sitting here. I've been through abusive relationships. I have thought about doing some things to my ex-husband that probably would have wanted me in here. Change is crucial if these women are ever going to make it in the free world. People down us because we're prostitutes and drug addicts. A lot of society does. They think we can't change. I don't want to go back out there and use, but I know once I hit the streets, I know what I'm capable of doing. I need that treatment in my life. I need that help. I need that extra push. MCIW tries to prepare them for life beyond the walls with intense drug rehab, high school and college courses, and critical job training. I believe that everybody should be punished for the crime they committed. But we try our best to prepare them to re-enter society and not make the same mistakes that they have made to get here in the first place. And the programs seem to be working. The inmates who participate cut their chances of reoffending by almost half. The prison sew shop offers some of the best training. The women learn marketable skills, and daily pay here goes up to $3.50. Behind bars, that's a big paycheck, and it's considered a privilege to work here. Lifer and convicted murderer Paris Pratt is one of 85 women who have landed a job here, making uniforms and flags for the state. The work keeps Paris busy and keeps her mind off being locked up. But the distraction only goes so far. It's like I'm really going through something with Ben myself. Wake up, you run the same people, doing the same dumb stuff. You work, you slave for a little bit of money, eat the same stuff that's disgusting. It's like really you had nothing to look forward to. Etta Myers also helps Paris get through the days. The two women work together in the sew shop. Etta is a fellow lifer and one of the few inmates she trusts. Etta has been here for 32 years. I used to think she got to be crazy to be still sane after 32 years, you know. Paris. But I guess as time go along and I learn how to cope with things and deal with things differently, maybe I might can be like her one day. Etta was convicted of killing a man during an attempted robbery in his home. I got locked up in 1977 for murder in the first degree with a handgun. Before I came to jail, I was married. I was a drug addict. Like Paris, she came to the prison in her early 20s and at first didn't think she would make it. There was nobody that I could trust in jail, so it was easier for me to stay by myself than to mingle with somebody who I didn't know anything about. I was very uneducated, very fragile, very empty inside, very frightened, very, very afraid. Oh. Okay, I'll wake up because... I met Paris about a year ago. She had just come into prison with a life sentence. They wanted her to know that there were people here who actually had been here for a long period of time and had fared just well. Her first question was, how long have you been here? And oh my God, you look so good. And I'm like, you know, I don't know what good is, but thanks. Etta knows that Paris is on edge. I don't think that it is hit up. Reality has really not set in. For most of us who serve a long sentence, it takes a couple of years before it actually settles in, before you're able to accept it. For the people that don't accept it, it's going to be really hard because life is hard in jail. They can get caught up in the madness and the negativity, and that'll only allow them to go to mental health and on lock. Etta hopes Paris can handle life behind bars without succumbing to madness or violence. She watches Paris closely, especially in the prison sew shop, where the edgy young inmate handles sharp tools. She doesn't want to see Paris 
or anyone else get hurt. All items must be carefully tracked. We do an inventory of all the tools. So when something turns up missing, all doors are locked, we'll put on lockdown. Until that particular tool is found. And at the start and close of each shift, Officers give everyone a thorough pat down. So anytime you come in and out, you're definitely safe. Scissors, screwdrivers, even needles. In the hands of an angry inmate, they could easily become lethal weapons. It's almost 11.30, lunchtime, and a large crowd is gathering in the chow hall. With so many inmates in one place, a lot can go wrong in just seconds. Inmate Christy Seal has been working hard to stay out of trouble and to make parole. But today in the chow hall, an ordinary lunch with her girlfriend goes wrong. Mind your business, stay out my business. It's not that hard, you know what I'm saying? An argument breaks out between the two of them. And suddenly, the girlfriend grabs Christy by the throat. Mind your business. Officers quickly stop the fight, and both women are taken into segregation immediately. I'm just trying to tell you, you shouldn't have to lock me up. I didn't do nothing. I didn't put my hands on nobody. So why they got handcuffs and nobody was trying to explain nothing to me? Now, Christy is in seg, despite her efforts to keep her record clean. And she fears that her chances of making parole and reuniting with her family are slipping away fast. Thursday morning at Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. Here, behind the mesh of razor wire, 900 of the state's worst female offenders are forced to live together. At any given time, about 20 of these inmates are pregnant. Among them is convicted burglar and drug addict Jill Newland, who is expecting twins. Three weeks remain until her delivery date. Every week, Jill undergoes a routine checkup. Her weight, blood pressure, and the baby's heartbeat, along with the size of the uterus. But today's exam brings some scary news. As is often the case with twins, the babies are ready to come out weeks ahead of schedule. Jill must head to the local hospital immediately. The anxiety started building up for the fact of knowing that it was coming to an end and reality set in a little. And it's just a scary situation. But even now, security cannot be compromised. Two officers are required to transport her, and she must wait for clearance at all checkpoints. Pregnant or not, she's still treated as a dangerous felon. I'm embarrassed and I'm upset that I put myself in the situation to have to go there pregnant and handcuffed. It just seems like it's surreal. It's like everything's just happening, and I, I feel sometimes like, what's going on? Is this real? The hospital is only 15 miles away, but it's a long drive for Jill. She doesn't know what this early delivery might mean for the unborn twins. Inside the prison gates, the grounds are unusually quiet. A prisoner is coming out of segregation, and Captain Hannah has cleared the entire area. All outdoor movement stops whenever an offender leaves her segregation cell. An officer escort always stays close by her side. It's all about keeping the inmates safe from attack. There's not supposed to be any inmates on the grounds. When the seg is moved, it's our responsibility to protect that inmate because they are handcuffed. So if something happens, they cannot defend themselves. If they're fighting somebody and that person has friends out in general population, then they could be a possible enemy. The extra security also protects the staff from getting hurt. 
Officers know they can never let their guard down when dealing with convicted criminals. Captain Hannah learned this the hard way. As a young officer, she survived a vicious inmate attack. It took months for her to recover. I had been on the job approximately four months, and I was attacked by an inmate, maximum security prison. A uh, segregation inmate ran down the tear, jumped me from behind, and he stabbed me. The shoulder, the back, the side of the face. I was stabbed five times. At first, I didn't even know that I was being stabbed because it just felt like punches. I came back to work because I knew the risk involved when I took the job. You could lose your life in prison. Captain Parker to all OICs, 1021 shift. Captain Hannah to all units, resume your movement, resume your movement. The attack is a constant reminder of how dangerous her job can be, especially when handling the volatile inmates housed in segregation. Also known as Locke, the 48 cells in SEG are reserved for the prisoners who break the rules. In Locke, Inmates are confined to their cells nearly every hour of every day, with only two showers a week. Inmates say it's dark and loud and frightening. For the prison, it's the ultimate discipline. For inmates, there's nothing worse. It can stay with them long after they get out. I used to be terrible at one point. I made a change in my life not to go back over there because it's not worth going over there. And now that's really how you lose your mind. You get absolutely nothing. So you're sitting in this little cell and I mean, people s scream out the windows all night and sing. I mean, they do anything that they possibly can to keep their mind off of what they're going through. Man, lock is horrible. You never come out to cell. You got all this time to sit in there and just look at walls and think and talk to yourself. I mean, who wants to be over there and be miserable like that? I know I don't. I'm in school. I'm trying to do what I need to do to get out of here. I'm not trying to make my time stop by going on the lot. You know what I'm saying? And I'm telling you, you don't want to go over there. Christy Seal has just come out of lock after fighting in the cafeteria with her inmate girlfriend. My girlfriend is a liar. I'm finding out a lot of things that she's doing, being sneaky, being phony with stuff. I found out she was telling somebody that I need her. I don't need you, miss. Are you crazy? And we got into it in the cafeteria, and we got into a heated argument, and she choked me. This was Christie's first trip back to SEG in months. Luckily, she was cleared of all charges this time. The prison ruled the instigator was Christie's girlfriend, who remains in lock. She's always putting her hands on me. There's a scratch mark on my neck where it's healing up right there. She did that, you know what I'm saying? She's, so I'm constantly smacking her back because I'm not gonna just keep allowing you to put your hands on me and think I'm not gonna smack you back. Hearing about the fight with her girlfriend, Captain Hannah brings Christie in for a talk after she is released from SEG. So what do you plan to do now? I'm going to try to stay away from her. And I did say try. We do not condone these relationships, but we know they do happen. Can't and it doesn't work out. Their fights, the women may do certain things or act certain ways towards other inmates just to make this particular one jealous. And it creates a lot of problems. My anger took, took over because I couldn't. It felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like everybody was ganging up on me. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to handle your anger issues. Um, what do you have planned for when you leave here? If you don't have a plan, you're gonna be back here. What about your education, college degree? Do you have your high school diploma? That's... I can't get it. Well, you, why? Cause I ain't smart enough yet. Yes, you are, don't say that. I mean, I waited till I was an old lady before I got my bachelor's degree, but I did it. <laughs> Come about. Hannah reminds Christy that she needs to stay focused on getting out and staying out of prison. That I want you to focus on. You're going to be okay. I just want you to focus on you. Yeah. You getting better. You healing emotionally. Because when you leave, and you will be leaving, I want you to stay gone. I do tell. <laughs> yeah, because I'm tired of seeing you in here. I'm tired of seeing myself in here. <laughs> I'm tired of seeing myself in here. Christy is going to work hard to avoid any more trouble. 
But while Christie is now out of SEG, 25-year-old murderer Paris Pratt has landed there for the very first time. She's been accused of spitting on another inmate, which is a serious offense here. Major Carrington is a 21-year veteran of MCIW. She leads the team that is investigating the case. Spitting on somebody is considered assault because that's another person's body fluid being um, put on somebody. Um, spitting, throwing urine, throwing feces, that's considered assault. It started innocently with Paris and a friend horsing around. But then it got out of hand. Because the case involves assault, both inmates will stay on lock until officers sort out the truth. Paris says she was unjustly accused. Nobody even cares enough to actually look into something and find the truth in it. And I think it's unfortunate that I have to sit in here and do all of this time and go through all of this and be miserable in here. Paris has never been in segregation before, and it sometimes makes inmates more unstable and more violent. Something's going to have to give because I just can't live like this. I have so many bad days in here because I have never seen nothing like this before. This is really hard for me to really cope in this place. If found guilty, Paris could be in lock for weeks. And for a lifer already on edge, it could prove too much to handle. <laughs> 3 p.m. at Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. A new shift takes over. And for their own safety, officers conduct a careful shakedown of the cell houses. Every day, every time a shift change, each officer that comes on, they have to do a search of the young common areas. Officers regularly shake down individual cells, but inmates also like to stash contraband, such as razors and drugs, in the common areas. If they want to hide it for somebody else to get, they will hide it in the common area. That way anybody can go get it, there's no claim to any specific person, so if you find it in the common area, you cannot say this belongs to this particular inmate. They're very creative in how they hide things. Um, they would hide stuff inside the trash can because they know nobody really wants to put their hands on that because it's unsanitary. They can hide stuff behind the paper, so you have to look under that to make sure that there are no razors, tobacco, or anything hidden behind that. You have marijuana, heroin, pills. And a lot of times, women will take other people's drugs, um, psychotropic drugs, just to get high. If they know that you're constantly searching and that you're being consistent with it, then they're less likely to hide it in these areas. Those caught with dangerous contraband end up in segregation or lock with other rule breakers like inmate Paris Pratt, who is just getting out from a one-week stay on an alleged assault charge. But she's not out of trouble yet. The prison concluded that Paris did not spit on anyone and has dropped the assault charge. But she still faces a hearing on a related violation from that night, aggressive horseplay. If found guilty, the inmate is in danger of seeing more seg time. The charge sounds relatively harmless, but the prison knows how easily things can escalate here. Hearing officer Barthlow oversees these disciplinary cases. It starts out as some minor type of play, but then someone takes offense to what's occurring in the way of too hard of a, of a bump uh, or some comment being made, and then the fists start flying. Sometimes, prisons allow another inmate to act as a sort of representative for the accused. She argues on Paris's behalf and ensures that she is treated fairly. During these sessions, the inmates must be heavily restrained. We've had incidences in the past where um, inmates have not been shackled, where 
uh, either the hearing officer or the officer assigned to the hearing was uh, injured with someone becoming upset and becoming physical as a result of the decisions that are made. Hearing officer Barthlow reads the report from that night. At approximately 6.40 p.m. while observing inmates returning from dinner, I observed inmate Paris Pratt, 923-505, and Crystal pulling each other shirt and chasing each other recklessly. I ordered them to stop horse playing and ordered them to go into the building. This is not a uh, violent uh, act. It's not a... The inmate representative secret. defends Paris, um, claiming she played no real part in the incident. Young... So in this case, Ms. Pratt actually um, did not do anything. They were coming from dinner. She was on her way into the building. She did not... You know, she did, was not reckless in any manner. But this isn't the first time Paris has been in trouble. She's had three similar violations in the past, and given her record, hearing officer Barthlow is not convinced. Uh, Ms. Pratt, after weighing what your representative has presented here through her arguments, what the uh, institution has presented through its evidence, I will find you guilty of the violation of 501. You're obviously having some problems uh, with you know, with the rules and your adjustment here. If you don't work with the system, then the system, you know, there are consequences to pay. And if you are found guilty of another violation within the next three months, it's mandatory that the hearing officer must impose segregation. That's disciplinary segregation. All right? Paris is lucky, but now walks a very thin line. If she breaks a rule again, Paris returns to lock immediately. Should I be happy? I don't have nothing to say right now. The thought of more seg time unnerves her. I can't live in there. So um, I can't function positively. It's just, it's like a, a big cage and it's traumatizing. I went crazy over there. I mean, I didn't know what to do. <sighs> You gonna sell all these cages like you're an animal, yelling, screaming. It was just crazy. Back in the sew shop, Paris tries to return to her routine and focus on work, but she can't shake off her anger over the day's events. I'm frustrated. This whole situation. I'm just sick of this institution. Like, I'm sick of this place. I'm sick of it because they all full of shit. Probably gonna get in trouble for saying this, but I don't even care no more. I don't. Paris knows her outburst could lead to more trouble, but controlling her frustration may prove even harder now. Outside of the prison, at the local hospital, Jill Newland has just given birth to two babies, Savannah Hope and Jacob Michael. The girl is, let's see, six pounds, 3.8 ounces. And the boy was five pounds, 4.3 ounces. So. Both are healthy. I was concerned when I first got here on how everything was going to go, you know, just being the high risk. But everything went okay. And um, I was very thankful. But even now, in the hospital, Jill is reminded that she is a convicted felon as well as a new mom. Officers, rather than family members, stand by her bedside for the big occasion. The officers stay in the room with me. They don't stay outside of the room. You can't just call your family and just expect everybody to come see you because it's a breach of security. I get really mad at myself. I'm like, look what I did now. Like, Jill, like, how stupid can you be? It's to let yourself get to this point. I mean, I should be with my family, with my husband, with his family. It should be a joyous occasion for everyone, you know? And here I am in prison giving birth. I definitely think the twins are getting a raw deal. 80% of the women at MCIW are mothers. And when they get locked up, their children are usually sent to live with other relatives or in foster care. In this case, Jill's husband will take care of the babies. He will pick them up from the hospital later today. I don't know if you can really get ready for something like that, but 
I guess, you know, I don't have a choice. I like to stop the clock. Sorry. It's a hard thing to go through. I didn't realize it was going to be this hard. In a few hours, Jill will be forced to give up her twins and return to an 8x5 cell. She has seven more years to go. Friday afternoon at Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. Inmate Christy Seal can't manage to stay out of trouble. This time it wasn't her girlfriend. It was a run-in with the prison therapist. At their weekly meeting, Christy accused the therapist of letting her down and lying to her at the top of her voice. I'm not going to just accept them to talk to me in the old kind of way. And I already have an anger issue. She already knows that. And then she just aggravated me to the point where I blew up in her office. They know that I don't put up with they bull Christy knows she may have hurt her chances of getting out early and reuniting with her mother and family. I've been doing so good, and I don't want to lose my winning streak of doing the right thing and making me feel like I'm a loser again. I'm trying to better myself. It's just time for me to do something different with myself. So you coming to the sessions tonight? I used to never cared, and now I care because I have a family to go home to. I got a family that's waiting for me. That's something I ain't never had. I can't mess up for them. I'm trying to go home to be with them. Captain Hannah sees inmates like Christy all the time who need real guidance to turn their lives around. Sometimes it takes a couple of times just to get it right. It takes a couple of times just to realize this is not a joke. I need to get my life in order. You do what you can to help them out. Inmate and new mother Jill Newland is back in her cell. Her newborn twins are gone, taken home by her husband. The baby just talks to me on the phone all day, you know, and then I want to talk to the babies a hundred times a day, and they can't talk back. And I miss the twins a lot, but um, right now it's like split emotions because I really want to be with my kids, but at the same time, I keep saying what good am I to my kids like that, you know, and you're not. You can't take care of children and be high. Jill is ready to return to the prison's intensive drug treatment program. She's fiercely determined to stay clean for good. I actually do feel like it's a fresh start. And I think if I just stay positive and just keep trying to do the things I need to do to stay focused, I'll be okay. I want to be clean. I want to do the right things. To help keep inmates like Jill focused, the prison offers a unique program for new mothers. Once a week, they can get a special visit where they openly hold and play with their babies. For two hours, they can be parents. If Jill stays on track, she'll see the twins, and the visits will remind her of why she needs to change. But while Jill Newland will eventually go home, convicted murderer Paris Pratt will not leave here, ever. These days, Paris has been staying out of trouble and out of luck, but she's only served one year of her life sentence. I don't know if I'm going to adjust to life here. One day I could say I'm going to adjust to life. The next day I could say I might take my own life because this is not living. This is just existing. I just don't think I can do it in here. I really don't. To keep herself sane, Paris will continue to look to fellow lifer, Etta Myers. It's a pretty frightening experience. I think that she'll come along, but I think that it's going to take some bumps and bruises along the way. It's going to take some time for her to accept the reality that she may be here for a very long time. I was going through it, so I probably will get there. If I have to be here for years and years and years and years, you know what I mean? You have no other choice because you have to deal with it, but I'm just not there yet. Only time will tell if Paris can adjust. 
Everybody has an issue. When they come in here, there's a reason why they did what they did. And what we try to do is to help them to process it, to look at ways that they can change within. Officers like Captain Hanna try to help the inmates find their way. I don't think that we should ever give up on people. I feel that my mission and my purpose is to help hurting women, even just through caring, just, just being a kind of a decent kind of human being. Day after day, Maryland's female felons continue to fill the cells at MCIW. Whatever their crimes, the prison and the officers give these troubled women the chance to change their ways. But in the end, it's a choice each inmate must make for herself.